But the first thing to understand about cutting is that every cutting blade is a wedge. Whether that wedge is a flat angle grind, a concave grind, or a convex grind, all of them are pieces of hard material that start off being thick and become rather thin. Wedges act like magnifying glasses for force. And what kind of forces are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the transfer of kinetic energy. And this is the energy given to an object by putting it in motion. And when an object stops against another object or is pressed against another object, it can transfer this energy given to it into the other object. It does this because two things don't want to exist in the same place at the same time. If I hit the apple with the knife, the apple moves. If I press the apple with the knife, the apple moves. And if I cut into the apple, it moves in the only way it's given the option to, which is apart from itself. The table has too much inertia for me to overcome it with the amount of kinetic energy I'm applying. So we stop suddenly when we hit the hard surface. The apple has absorbed what it can and is redistributed in the way it needs to in order for the universe to work. If I have something big enough that I cleave through the apple with, then there may be enough put into the system to even go through the table to a degree. Of course, I'm not going to do that to my table, but you get the idea. That's why it has to happen. How it happens, though, there's two things going on. There's something going on on the macro level, and there's something going on on the micro level. You know, we're going to talk about the macro level. Since the apple has to get out of the way of the wedge occupying the same space that it does, its only choice in certain circumstances is to divide away from itself. I'm going to draw a little bar here. And we're going to say that we have two forces. Now, the first is a normal force. And... A normal force is straight up and down, or altitudal transversal. The second is a shear force, and a shear force is longitudal transversal. The material that we want to cut has both normal force resistance and shear force resistance. And we have to greatly overcome one or both of these in order to get through the apple. Our wedge helps us do this, but let's say I just apply a shear force right about here. We'll start here. Well, I do cut into the apple, but I don't cut all the way through the apple. And let's say I apply an even amount of normal force. Eh, not much happens. It indents, which you probably can't see very well on the camera, but we don't get a nucleation of a crack. Now, if I apply an even amount of normal force and shear force at the same time, it easily cuts into the apple. Something important to note here is that once shear force has been used to nucleate a cut, that cut can be propagated with normal force alone, just as easily as if you did it with shear force as well. Soft materials tend to have more shear resistance than they do normal resistance. So when we lower the shear resistance is then easier to break through with normal resistance. 
If I take a square of paper and I drop it on this water, it starts off by floating. And if I push it and the water envelops it, then it sinks. There is tension on the surface of the water and breaking that tension is required to pass through the rest of the material. And in the case of water, its internal resistance is less than on its surface. This is why a diamond can scratch many other materials, most other materials, but it can also be shattered by a hammer. Because while a diamond is very hard, it's not very tough. There is no object that's 100% hard and 0% tough, or 100% tough and 0% hard. It works on something of a sliding scale. Likewise, the type of force that we need to get through it, shear force or normal force, also works on a sliding scale. If we want to go through a piece of plate armor, a Bectic Corbin would probably work better than the edge of a longsword. So, on the micro level, what we have going on here, both of our edges canceling out in a terminal edge. And through moving this, all the mass that this contains is concentrated on this very small area of effect, which creates a relatively tremendous amount of force here. And when that comes into a contact with the surface, it depresses it, and it creates something of a pinch. The energy being transferred from this causes a lot of excitement here, and at a certain point, this has to cleave and begin to separate. And this tends to cause fracturing ahead of the actual cleave that because material has been put in motion and is trying to get away from this point of stress will help it to come apart easier as our edge progresses through or propagates the cut. So that's the need to know of how cutting works. Now, there's a lot of other little stuff that could be covered, amongst which there are two PDFs, a Google ebook, all three of which are free to access, and there's some additional reading provided in the form of an older book that's been reprinted for many years and that you can pick up pretty affordably. You're gonna find that a lot of that is covered. Some of the stuff are half-truths, like when a blade cuts, it's breaking molecular bonds or destroying cohesion, or that even a blade that you resharpen on an oil stone or whetstone has these micro serrations that cause a blade to cut in the same way that a saw does. Things that in general for your everyday knife are not true but are also kind of true in the case of some specific blades made but if you have the time and you want a lot more in-depth information and you want to see all the mathematics and geometry behind it take a look at the links i provided in the description below I hope, however, that I've given a nicely tied up, generalized view of how cutting works, and that this can serve as an aid to people discussing the sharpening and application of blades. That's all for now. Have a good one.